Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We don't know what he will do, but we can come expecting for him to move. I'd like you to stand with us. Let's celebrate all that we have in him today. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, that mercy for me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of
may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to all of you who needed a week to adjust to the time change. I'm almost adjusted. Takes a while. I don't know how many, how many of you filled out a bracket for the NCAA tournament? 22 million people filled out brackets for the NCAA tournament. Zero perfect brackets remaining at this point. It's been a year of phenomenal upsets, and it makes me think about Easter, right? Everybody thought, okay, we killed him. He's dead and gone. No, not so much, right? It's getting close. Corey's going to tell you more at the end of service about some more that we're going to try to do to try to invite other people to come alongside and worship the Lord and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So uh, I want you to be thinking about that. We're going to have a great time today. Welcome to everybody. If you're new, if you're fairly new, in that uh, bulletin you hopefully received on the way in, you have a connection card. If you would please just share a little bit about yourself with us, we would really appreciate it. We want to let you know that we're so glad that you're here and that uh, we, we've got a lot of wonderful things going on that we hope you'll be a part of. And so we want to get to know you better. Also on the back, as always, please share your prayer requests with us. Monday is a day when we have our staff meetings, and at that meeting we always pray through the prayer requests that we receive on those cards. And so please know that if you write one down, it will be lifted up. And that's an important part of our ministry. We know we believe in the priority and power of prayer. So that's, uh, that's something that, that we can all share in together. So we're going to have our moment of, of greeting one another, saying good morning to each other. I'm going to challenge you to, uh, yes, it's wonderful that we have our close friends. We, we get to enjoy them on a regular basis. So let's just push ourselves a little bit. And if you see an unfamiliar face, I'm not saying a strange face because that's not nice. An unfamiliar face, say good morning to him and introduce yourself. Let's do that now.
perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. that is your practice, a lifestyle of worship, praising Him all week. Let's sing that one more time together. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. In Him we live and move and have our being. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in Him. Thank you, he died in Rome. 
that incredible stirring and inspiring song we are reminded of this theme of this book from your word when you inspired Peter to write about our living hope and Lord we're reminded that our living hope must reside in you in the accomplished fact of the resurrection as we view uh, as we look forward to April 9th, and, and all that that means for us, we're excited for what it means for us today. And I pray that you'll speak to us, I pray you'll move us and stir us, and Lord, that we'll begin to understand that some of the shaping and some of the hard times come because they have to for us to become who you want us to be. So we pray that you will, uh, Lord, draw us to yourself in that this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell you what, I was almost ready to give the invitation after that song, Daniel. That was, whew, praise God for that. Thank you to the choir and appreciate Ainsley on that. You know something I've never done? I've never gone into a store, gotten something off the shelf, and then been surprised on my way out of the store that the store wanted me to pay for the item. That's never come as a shock. And yet, for the people of God, when God says that following him is going to have a cost, it's surprising how often we end up shocked. I mean, I've been surprised how much items pay in stores sometimes, but I usually check that before I go to pay. Sometimes I just leave it with them because it means more to them than it does to me. In the Old Testament with the people of God, God told them exactly what it meant to be his people. And he told them from the beginning, he said, if you disobey me, if you rebel, if you go after other gods, you will be defeated and you will go off into exile. And when they did what they weren't supposed to do, they were in shock that God did exactly what he said he was going to do. Over in the New Testament, if we take it from a slightly different angle, if we pay attention to the parables, Jesus told multiple parables that we're supposed to count the cost 
of discipleship. We're told by Jesus, we're guaranteed that we're going to have some struggles and troubles in this world. Other New Testament writers warn us that if we follow after God, if we follow Jesus, we're going to have struggles, we're going to have trials, and lo and behold, when they come on us, how often do we respond with shock? How, should, how is this happening? Why is this happening? We're surprised, and Peter's been pretty clear that we shouldn't be surprised. He's kind of bringing that emphasis to a point this morning, and he's making it really clear to us that we need to not be shocked. Don't be surprised. But instead, when these things happen, when trials, when persecution, when ridicule comes, he says, instead, bask in the glory Bask in the taste of heaven that comes with being ridiculed for your faith. What does that mean? Well, 1 Peter chapter 4, start in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the outcome for for those who do not obey the gospel of God be? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Don't be surprised at persecution. He's telling us, look, if we're not careful, if, if we allow these things to shock us, if we allow these things, if, if, we, if we aren't living with the understanding that there's a lot of the world that's not going to like what it means for us to follow Christ, and that we may well be in line for some ridicule or some kind of persecution, he says, what's going to happen is that we're going to end up being overwhelmed, and we're going to live in fear rather than faith. So he says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. That that terminology, fiery ordeal, is a reminder of a big part of why God allows us to go through trials is because they have a refining effect on us, right? You know, when, when they get ore from the ground, it's not ready to use, is it? They have to refine. They have to refine. And you and I, we need to be refined. It says, don't, don't be shocked, but instead understand that God is at work. Does God want us to suffer? No, it's not that God wants us to suffer, but it is true that God wants us to be like Christ. And if we could just be honest with the person in the mirror... We will understand that there are things in that person's life, there's things in my life and there's things in your life that do not belong in the life of a child of God. And sometimes those things are fairly deeply embedded. And God has to take the chisel or he has to turn up the heat. Because one of the things that we've got to embrace and understand as a child of God is that God cares far more about our character than he does our comfort. I'm not talking about the kind of comfort that that you receive when you're grieving. I'm talking about the kind of comfort that we cherish so much. You know, we, we like to be comfortable. We go and buy chairs and beds so that we'll be comfortable, right? 
And, and if we aren't careful, we can kind of carry that mentality into all of life. And God says, no, there are things about you that you need to be uncomfortable about. And I'm going to go after those in the life of my child. And, and he goes after those in my life, and he goes after those in your life. And that's part of why he says, look, this, this fiery ordeal is going to be for your good. It's going to be for your testing. But don't be shocked as though something strange or unexpected is happening to us. We just have to admit there's a lot of work to be done. So God is at work through the heat and the blows and all that may come. And we need to explore this. Because as we, as we understand what it means for us to live life in this world, and Peter's talked about us as aliens or strangers in this world, there's a leading Christian researcher, he looks at, at trends and, and, and things about Christians in America, and he says, we as Christians in America need to learn to live as exiles. You stop and you think about, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that this is not your native land. Well, that's hard because we were raised in this land. It feels like our native land, but he's trying to get us to understand that this world's not our home. And so because of that, we're at a place in a time where we may not be treated great. But it's also a reminder that we have a greater home. We, we have a place where we do belong, and that's what we're preparing for. Verse 13, he says, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. I don't know if you caught it in that verse. So let me read it again, and I want you to count with me. How many times do you hear a form of the word joy? Okay. To the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. See, that's not how you want a verse to start where you're going to talk about joy, is it? That's, that would be not our preferred preference. But here we are. Keep on rejoicing. One. Right? Is this on? Is this? Are we good back there? Are we good, Stan? Okay. That's one, right? Okay. I know, I know, I know. We're talking about sufferings and trials and then we're going to connect rejoicing to it. And something deep within us goes, no. But no, this is how it works. Okay, so one, keep on rejoicing so that the revelation is glory. You may also rejoice and be overjoyed. Three times. It's not what we would expect, right? It's not the first thing that joins to, jumps to our minds. But... It, what we've got to understand, what is he saying here? Is he saying that we should be super glad that we're going through painful things? No, that's not the point. The point is that we need to be overjoyed and rejoicing that God is working on us and that we get to be a part of what Jesus is about. So remember that Whatever trial you might be going through in the time, that's not the end of the story. That's not the final word. Jesus is coming again one day. And when Jesus comes again, let's just put it as a giant understatement, things are going to change a little bit. All right? There's going to just be a little bit of difference. Some things are going to get straightened out. When we're talking about the return, we're talking about the judgment. He's going to use these things to remind us. There's going to come that moment in which Jesus is going to be shown for exactly who he is. So we rejoice because we know that in the moment of our suffering, God is at work in us to make us more like Jesus. And we also rejoice because we're reminded that Jesus is going to come back, that he's going to be eternally King of kings and Lord of lords, and that we're with him. And he's going to include us with blessings and a reality that honestly the writers of Scripture struggle really hard to describe with any human language. It's too good. It's too great. It's too far beyond. 
And so when we look at this, it's what James is talking about in James 1, 2, 3, 4. He says, consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. Notice there's not a period after trials. If there was, that would be weird. Wouldn't it? I mean, if it was just, oh, yay, I, I, I get to suffer. Just for the sake of suffering, that would be problematic. But it's not a period, is it? It's a comma. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature, mature and complete, lacking in nothing. This is a contrast to the panic and fear that we might be tempted to slip into when persecution or ridicule comes. He uses a strong adversative at the beginning of verse, beginning of verse 13. He's saying, contrast this, contrast this. It's not this, it's, it's, it's something else. And what he's trying to say to us is the same thing that Jesus said to us in the Sermon on the Mount. We've already talked about it a few times, and that's that we're blessed when we're persecuted for the name of Jesus. We're blessed when we suffer and persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Remember that God is the one who gets to determine what's blessed and what isn't, right? He's the one who gets to say. So the only suffering that really counts here is the suffering that we experience for our allegiance to Jesus. He says, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. This is something that Peter speaks to from personal experience. The first few chapters of the book of Acts are telling us about this phenomenal change that happened to Peter on the day of Pentecost. You know, the Holy Spirit came. And Peter, Peter became this bold preacher of the gospel. He became this, he, he and John called before the Sanhedrin. And they're not intimidated. They get arrested. They're getting mistreated. And when all that happens, in, in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, this is their response, which is what? It says, they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing, there's that word, that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on behalf of the name. That's a different take, isn't it? Okay, well, how does this work? That's a good question. Well, it, hurt, it, it, it works as we remember what's being talked about in verse 14. Let me go back and read it again. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You, can, you, can, you. you need to understand verse 13, the revelation of his glory. Verse 14, the spirit of glory. So what's he talking about here? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it's also addressed as this. For this reason, because of the, the, the willing sacrifice and the, the, the taking on of, of being human and, and everything that Jesus went through, for this reason, God highly exalted him, the Lord Jesus, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, just stop and ask yourself, who is not included in what follows? Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven. All right? So what does he mean by those who are in heaven? He's talking about the faithful who have died, and he's talking about the angels. Right? Yes. Okay. Y'all got to work with me this morning. I don't know if y'all dozing out there. What's going on? Get some espressos going in here. All right, how about those who are on earth? Every human being. Every human being. Yeah? Even the ones who make fun of Jesus. Even the ones whose little fish on their car has legs and has the name Darwin in the middle of it. Yeah? Even the ones who've worshipped a God of a different name. Okay? Every knee will bow. And then 
under the earth. What's he talking about? He's talking about those who rebelled against him. He's talking about the demons. He's talking about Satan himself. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My friends, there's going to come a beautiful, powerful moment of utter and complete vindication in which every creature will admit who Jesus is. Now you and I, if we have given our lives to Jesus Christ, if we are surrendered, if we have trusted in him, if we've received his grace and salvation, we're doing that now. And we live in a world though, where most people have not done that, and most people unfortunately are not going to do that, we're told in scripture, And so we live in a difficult circumstance, in a difficult environment. But I want to encourage you with the reality that anybody who denies that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of all that is, anybody who denies that does not for one nanosecond change the reality of who Jesus is. They're just wrong. We need to entrust ourselves completely to the God who is King of kings and Lord of lords, the Lamb who was slain, who won the victory, and is now enthroned in heaven to receive praise forever and ever. The consummation of his victory will be sweet and it will be eternity. That really does matter now. So that at the revelation of his glory, we will understand, we will rejoice, and we will be overjoyed. And we understand if we are insulted for the name of Christ, that we are blessed. Because God says so. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Our response to persecution, ridicule, or any of these things is going to be a great indicator to us about how real our faith is. We're going to know in that moment. When Jesus returns, there's that ultimate revelation that everything's straight and everybody has to admit. Peter's saying we need to bring that into the right here and the right now. Because insults are going to come. Ridicule's going to come. For us, like it was for them in that moment, the word insult tells us it's mostly verbal. It's mostly verbal. It still doesn't feel good. It's still not fun. But how do we stand? What are we going to do? The curveball for us is to remember that in that moment, we're blessed. Say, well, I don't feel blessed. One of the great little tools that I learned in discipleship that was passed down to me, I think maybe Bill Bright was the one who came up with it, is to draw a simple, old-fashioned train. There's the engine, steam, right? There's the fuel car, and there's a caboose. The engine stands for the facts of God, what God says. The caboose stands for my feelings. Where are you going to shovel the fuel? Where are you going to place your faith? Because that's what the fuel represents. Sometimes I've been guilty and I've shoveled the fuel into my feelings. Our feelings are real and they're important. We are emotional creatures, but feelings are a terrible leader. You know what's good to depend on and count on is the facts of God. When God says this is how it is, us trusting, okay, God, you know what you're talking about. This is how it is. So if it happens, rather when it happens, and we receive this opposition, we've got to trust, okay, God, you say I'm blessed in this moment. Don't feel real blessed right now, but I'm going to trust you with it. All right. So then what comes next? What carries the most weight for us? 
Well, he says, here's help. The spirit of God and of glory rests on you. What does that mean? Well, we're reminded. We're reminded in Scripture that, by the way, let me just be real clear for those who might be confused because somebody told them something different. We're told several times in the New Testament that at the moment of salvation, because salvation cannot come without the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life, okay? At the moment of salvation, you have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you. Now, the Holy Spirit of God within us is described a few times to us as the down payment or the first the first experience of our eternal heavenly reality. Because the best part of heaven is going to be what? It's sure not going to be the pavement. We love to talk about the golden streets. You ever stop? That's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, if you sell asphalt for a living, I can understand how you might be enthralled with asphalt. <laughs> the best part of heaven is not going to be your mansion. Because when you really study that, maybe I don't know, maybe that means apartment. It doesn't matter. What's going to be the best part of heaven? You're going to be in the unmitigated presence of God forever. You're going to see Jesus face to face. And for right here and right now, we have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us. And his spirit within us is the promise of all this to come, and it's currently our experience of his presence and his glory, the, the, the hint of all, of all that's to come. Think about this. This is about assurance. In the, the big picture of eternity, verse 15, now make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. Now, this is a challenge. We got to make sure that we're not just because we're going through something, and, and we, we're taught in our society today to have a victim mentality no matter what happens. If you're being a jerk, or if you're being mean, or if you have literally broken the law, or if you have sinned against God, and you go through some sort of punishment for that or some sort of ridicule, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about with anyone suffers as a Christian, verse 16. He's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. So when he says in verse 14, the glory, the spirit of glory, the spirit of God and of glory rests upon you, then he picks that word back up in verse 16. It's not when we suffer because we've done something wrong or we've been mean or we've been a jerk or whatever. It's when we suffer as a Christian. This is one of the very few times that the word Christian is actually used in the New Testament. And when, when you suffer, what, what is he saying here? He's saying you and I need to be ready to own our identity. We need to be ready to own the fact that we are Christians. We're followers of Jesus Christ. The most fundamental identifying factor of you and me in our lives is that we are Christians. And when the world doesn't like it or when people don't like it, when they come after us about it, are you ashamed? Are you embarrassed? Or do you say, yeah, that's right. I'm a Christian. I mean, one of the most impactful moments that many of us remember was that Columbine shooting so many years ago, right? And that gun was held on that teenage girl, and that question was directly asked. Are you a Christian? She says yes, and she dies. It happens all the time in the world. When the Christians in Egypt were being beheaded a few years ago, it happens all the time.
for most of us, most of the time, though, nobody's trained a deadly weapon on us. We're just dealing with our feelings. I'm being made fun of for my faith. How do I feel about that? What am I going to do? How am I going to respond? Is it okay? Am I going to own it? Or am I going to crab walk somehow? He says, hey, if you suffer as a Christian and you're not ashamed, you're not to be ashamed, but instead you glorify God in this name. In other words, praise God that I'm a Christian. So it's not just like, oh, I'm barely getting past, all right, I'm not going to be embarrassed. All right, maybe that's where... But, but he's saying, no, you, you glorify God. Yes, I get to be a Christian. Because why? Because we understand. We understand what he's getting ready to say. And that is that we didn't deserve any of this. Any of the, anything with the word glory attached, right? We don't deserve to be part of. But by the grace and mercy of the living God, we get to be. And we get to understand, so we, we rejoice, we rejoice, we're overjoyed. We're not going to be ashamed. We're going to glorify God because of this name, because of this title, because of being a Christian. He says, do not, don't fall into the trap of being ashamed. I told you a few minutes ago that Peter spoke from his personal experience in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, that it, it is possible to rejoice when you're being ridiculed, when you're being, you know, that you count it as a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus. But I would also remind you that Peter's writing from experience in this verse too. If anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed. Because remember, this is the guy right, who went from swearing to Jesus, I will die with you, to denying Jesus by a fire. As Jesus was going through that kangaroo court, that mockery of justice at which his death sentence would be brought about, when a little servant girl approached Peter and said, hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus? He couldn't take it. Three times, right? Then the rooster crows. You know what the worst part of that was? Luke tells us Jesus looked and he saw Peter. He looked Peter straight in the eye. So I think when Peter says, trust me on this, don't be that person. We should listen to it. Unfortunately, a lot of us can probably give some example from our own lives. We look back with some regret. I wish I'd have taken a stronger stand. I wish I'd have been more clear about my faith. He says, own it. Don't be ashamed, but glorify God in this name of being a Christian. Because here's the deal. This world isn't all there is. This isn't all she wrote. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What's he saying here? Well, he's saying, God's the judge. Understand this. Those who mock you are not the judge, but they will be judged by the very one they mock, the one that they're mocking you about. And the judgment begins with us. We say, wait a minute, what do we want? I was kind of hoping we'd miss that part. Well, this is not to bring into doubt our salvation, but we are told in Scripture that some things will be judged about our lives, specifically our works. And how we've lived. 
And those things are going to be put to the test. Little fire is going to be brought to them. And what's going to happen in that moment? Have you ever thought about that? I, it's not, oh my goodness, am I going to be saved? No, if, you know, if you're in Jesus Christ, you're going to be saved. But you are never going to have a point in time when it's more starkly clear to you, I don't deserve to be saved. See, your life is going to be brought up against the holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you and I, we're going to be super clear in that moment. Wow. That's what grace means. I can't look at the enormity of what Jesus did for me. It's going to be made crystal clear for us. Not, not, not any of us. None of us. None of us are going to go through that and have any shred of pride or hubris or like, whew, yeah, I deserve to be here. I think about that, how amazing and wonderful it's going to be. He says, if, well, then what's going to be the outcome for those who don't believe in the gospel of God? If it's with difficulty the righteous are saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Why is it so difficult? Well, what had to happen for you to be saved? God the Son had to leave his throne in glory, become a human being. Jesus, baby, Bethlehem, Christmas, yeah. He had to live a perfect, sinless life. Then he had to go through the ultimate humiliation that's ever been gone through in the history of the world, and he died on the cross he suffered, bled, and died for the forgiveness of our sins and our reconciliation to God. My friends, it's the hardest thing ever because God had to do it. Humans could not do this. And then he rose from the dead. Again, people can't do that. And if, if that's what it takes for us to be saved, anybody who's relying on anything else, their own effort or some other religious system or whatever, it won't help. There's no other way. It's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. People who are upset at John 14, 6, which is coming up very quickly on a Wednesday night near you. I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Who are you to say that Jesus is the only way? Look, I didn't write it. I'm just reporting it. Why are you mad that God made a way for you to be saved? Wrap your brain around that. People are mad that God made a way for them to know him and be forgiven and live forever. Well, there should be more than one. No, there can't be more than one way. There's only one way. Praise God, he made a way. And we need to help people know that way. All who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to the faithful creator in doing what is right. He ends simply with this reminder that regardless of what it may be in creation that comes after us, regardless of any aspect of creation that comes after us, you and I need to remember that we are held by the Creator. And He's greater than any aspect of creation, no matter how scary it may seem. So bask in the taste of heaven and the glory of God. We get to live unashamed in this. As we respond this morning, what do we need to take away? What do we need to respond with? How do we need to think and integrate this as Daniel comes to lead us in this? First of all, we should be encouraged with this reminder again. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. When it happens to you, when you encounter opposition for your faith, it's not an if, my friends. It's a when. W-H-E-N. It's going to happen. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. 
So, we just remember all the promises of God that are attached to it. All the joy and rejoicing and glory and all these terms he's used. Secondly, the encouragement here in this passage is for us to live true to our Christian identity. You're a citizen of heaven walking on earth. Let that always and ever be the first thing that defines who you are. And finally, that we would trust that the creator is holding on to us regardless of what's happening in creation itself. As we respond, we're going to stand here in just a moment. I'm going to pray here and and we're going to have an opportunity to respond to God. If you have not yet surrendered to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I hope you hear what Peter was saying this morning. We can be saved. It took the hardest thing ever, praise God. But there certainly is nothing else in which you can trust. So call upon the name of the Lord Jesus this morning. I'm going to be down here if you, if you want to have some help and encouragement about how that can happen in your life. As always, being a part of a community of faith is a great encouragement for us as we go through this life as Christians. And we love to have anybody who's not yet a part of a church family to become a part of our Emmanuel family. We also can pray for ourselves when we encounter these things and pray for each other. Pray for courage and pray that we would own our faith. Pray that we won't back down or crab walk or or be ashamed or whatever it might be. Let's stand firm and strong. Lord, we want to live unashamed for your name. That as Christians, we, we wear your name. That we follow you, that we love you. That you are more important than anything else in our lives. For our lives belong to you. Lord, it can be a challenge for us because it doesn't feel good to be ridiculed, much less to be persecuted. It can be scary, it can be intimidating, and our feelings are very powerful within us. Help us cling to your truth, help us follow you, help us be bold and unashamed. Help us love like you loved. Lord, we pray it this morning in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. And respond to him as he leads you this morning. One day, One day when heaven is filled with his praises. One day when sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory revealed living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far Rising, he justified, really forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him, Calvary's mountain. One day. Down on a tree, took the nails for me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified.
glorious name. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Yes! salvation, our living hope this morning. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. Well, it's not often that I have a bunch, a bunch of announcements. A lot of times I'm trying to scrape a couple together just to have a valid reason to get up here, but today's not one of those days. Um, several of you need me to announce things um, that are pertinent and to do it right now, so I'm going to do it. So just bear with me. I've got a few more than normal. Um, the first is our business meeting is tonight. Um, that's at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, so we would encourage you, if you have time, please do come to that. Um, we do them once per quarter now, and so um, you don't have the opportunity to be a part of that as often. Again, that's here um, in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. tonight. Also, Financial Peace University began last week, and if you were not able to make it or you would like to attend starting tonight, that, that is tonight at 6 p.m. in room 109. Um, and so... Uh, if you'd like to do that, you can talk to Phyllis some more, or you can just go to room 109 tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, the No Other Gods Bible study is tonight at 5 p.m., not at 4 p.m., so 5 p.m. if you're part of that Bible study. Also, Saturday, March 25th, the RA boys will be going to Bailey's Welding Service to learn about welding. Uh, lunch will be provided. Um, they're asking that you would have your son at Bailey's by 9 a.m. to get things going. Um, if you have questions or you need more information, you can talk to Rob North. He can get you figured out there. Again, that's this Saturday. Please have your son there at 9 a.m. Um, also, Square Foot Gardening begins this Saturday. Um, there's some more information in your bulletin if you are interested. We mentioned that last week, um, a series about how to grow your own food, how to do it efficiently. So please do uh, consider that. The wonderful greeting team that some of you have experienced as you've come through our doors, they're looking for a couple more volunteers. So if you think you'd like to serve as a greeter, um, as a ministry of your own, they would love to talk to you about that. It's fairly simple. You smile, wear a name tag, and tell people you're glad they're here. Uh, but you do have to be, you do have to be friendly. That's kind of one of the, <laughs> one of the main, one of the main requirements of that job. So please do, if you're if you're interested in that, you can come to the office, talk to one of the pastors, uh, talk to one of the staff members, or just talk to one of the greeters. Um, also, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is in full swing until the end of April. Our goal this year is $22,500, and as of this last week, we're just shy 
of $6,000. All right, I got it right. Uh, we would ask that you'd prayerfully consider giving to this special offering that we do uh, once a year. It does go to a great cause. Uh, this, this is one of two special offerings that we do per year, so please do consider that through uh, the end of April. Um, also, back to our Bible studies, a new study called From Egypt to Canaan is beginning tonight with Mike Tabbitt. Um, the study will be at 5 p.m. only tonight, so it's going forward, it's going to be at 6, but because of the business meeting, tonight it's at 5. Um, so if you would like to be a part of that, talk to Mike, um, and I think there's some more information in your bulletin. As we do each week, we'd like to encourage you to come to our Wednesday night meal. Um, we do that from 5 to 6 o'clock on Wednesdays. In your connection card, there's a spot on the back you can RSVP with a number of people. In your bulletin, there's a way you can do that digitally. Um, and then from 6 to 7, we all split off into age groups, really little kids that way, kind of little kids that way, and then adults in here, and we worship and learn more about the Word of God. So we'd encourage you to come to that. It's free. Donations um, are not required, but they're encouraged if you're able to do that. So please do join us for that. Our numbers have been steadily going up and up and up and up each week. Um, as we've been doing the last couple of weeks leading up to Easter, each Sunday when I finish announcements, we've taken a moment to pray for somebody in our lives that either don't know the Lord or maybe know the Lord, but they've wandered from him. So they're not in church anymore. Um, they're not living out their Christian faith. And so we want to do the same thing today. We want to take a moment to, to pray for somebody in your life. On your connection card on the back, there's a spot with red ink that says, please join me in praying for. That's a spot to put for the person you're thinking of or praying for today. So please do that and turn that connection card in so we can also pray for the person in your life. Additionally, um, we've had these cards made up that we're going to hand out next Sunday in your bulletins. There's some at each exit, rubber banded, if you'd like to get a head start. But this is just a very low risk way that you can invite um, your family members, your friends, your coworkers to church. If you're not ready to share the gospel with them, we get it. That's okay. But let's start somewhere. And so these cards are available today um, over here on the tables or in the front on the tables. They're run, rubber banded in groups of five. Um, and then next week we'll have them in the bulletins. But this is kind of the final step in our prayer emphasis. We can pray and pray and pray, but we need to take action at some point. And so join me for the next 30 seconds or so, thinking of the person, praying for the person in your life that doesn't know the Lord or maybe has wandered from the Lord and that you would like to see come back to him because you know the goodness of God. Let's do that right now. Father, we are so grateful that you are so good to us and that you have called us out of the darkness. And Lord, we come to you today for two reasons. Um, every one of us in this room today knows somebody in our lives that is not right with you. And the scripture very clearly tells us that their path is the wide road to destruction and hell forever. And so, Lord, we lift up each one of the people that have been prayed for or are being prayed for right now to you that you would see them, that you would work effectively in their hearts to soften their hearts, to prepare them for a gospel conversation, to help them to see the light. And Lord, secondly, that you would give us the strength, the courage, the initiative to live out the Christian life you've called us to. And that Christian life is not just coming to church on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays, but that Christian life is called to go and make disciples of all the nations and so help us where we're, where we're scared, where we're nervous, where we're inexperienced, where we're um, not sure um, if people are going to make fun of us, like Pastor Dave mentioned today. Lord, we know that the power of your spirit overcomes all of those things, and so we need you to accomplish this in our lives. So for the next couple of weeks, as we continue this prayer emphasis, Lord, we pray and we trust that you will move in a mighty way for the people that are dearest to us, that are distant from you, or that are completely lost, and that you call your enemies right now. Lord, we thank you for hearing us, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for telling us that we can come to you, and when we pray to you, you hear us, and that you respond. We trust you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, before we dismiss, Pastor Dave, Pastor Daniel, and I will be right down here in the front. If we haven't had a chance to say hello to you uh, today or ever, we'd love to do that. If you're a guest today and you don't know where to go for Sunday school, you can go out this door and to your right, and there's some information for you there. You guys have a great Sunday.